So more than a thousand years ago, a woman living in the Heian court, known as Murasaki Shikibu, wrote what is widely considered the first Japanese novel. The novel is called The Tale of Genji, and is still studied and talked about today. In fact, they've made Japanese animations based off of it. The original manuscript, however, no longer exists, but it's been translated in copy and read in Japanese schools. Although the characters in the book are fictional, the work still gives us a unique depiction of the lifestyles of the high imperial court during the Heian period. So what is the Heian period? Well, in 784 after Christ, the Japanese emperor moves its capital from Nara to Heian. Heian is modern day Kyoto, but at this time it's called Heian or Heian Kyo. And modern day Kyoto will then remain the imperial capital for the next a thousand years. So the Heian period, as it came to be called, refers to the years between 794 and 1185 after Christ. It's also referred to as the golden age of Japanese history. The Heian period lasted for a very long time. Because the Heian period lasted for so long, it's usually split up into three time periods. So we have early Heian, which is 794 to 951, middle Heian, 951 to 1086, and late Heian period, 1086 to 1186. But during this time period, the power became concentrated into the hands of the elite Fujiwara clan. And the Fujiwara clan was a family that dominated the imperial court and brought peace into the capital. And because of the peaceful times in the capital and the wealth of the imperial court, there was a lot of opportunity to be creative. And we see a rise in imperial artworks such as paintings, prints, and scrolls, and writings depicting the imperial life. So many generations to follow actually admire the Heian period because of its wonderful artworks. This period is also noted for the rise of the samurai class, which we all know about. Um, which would eventually take power and start the feudal period of Japan. So that's when they have those big samurai wars and there's a lot of death. But to set the stage for now, it's not really like that. The Japanese imperial court developed as the center of an elite culture. In this time of peace and prosperity, the aristocracy had the leisure to play musical instruments, write poetry, and create art. There were no more of a thousand of these elite people but their taste set the tone for the rest of Japan. And that's pretty typical. Usually the people with the most power set the tone for the rest of the country. Poetry was very important to the imperial elite of Japan because they were actually very influenced by China and Chinese poetry. Being able to read and write poetry was a symbol of one's status. So women in the Heian court actually did read. Women would typically write using hiragana, a simplified version of the Japanese writing system. Women did not often write in Chinese, which was used for government documents. The court was divided. Women generally stayed in their own area behind screens, not to be seen by other men and to only be seen by either their fathers or their husbands. The clothing of the imperial court was colorful and decorative. It was usually worn in layers, and women grew their hair out very long during this time. And we'll actually see illustrations from the 12th century depicting um, the tale of Genji. Within the Heian court, there were some notable female authors, and the author we're going to be focusing on today is Murasaki Shikibu, and she is famous for writing the tale of Genji. So let's talk a little bit about Murasaki Shikibu as well. There's some mystery that surrounds this woman because Murasaki Shikibu is not her real name. It's more of a kind of stage name given to her or a nickname given to her later. Murasaki means purple, but it's also the name of the main heroine in her story, which Genji, the main character, falls in love with, so she may be named after that. Shikibu is just a post that her father once held while he was serving the imperial court. So Murasaki was born in 973 AD after Christ into the Japanese imperial court. Her family was a middle-ranking family of provincial governors. The lower-ranking families such as hers did not usually live in the palace, but because of her grandfather having been a well-respected and well-known poet, her family were able to live amongst those in power. And when Murasaki was in her early to mid-twenties, she married an elite man whom she had a daughter with. He died, however, two years after their marriage. Murasaki always enjoyed writing. She, became, she began writing before she was married and continued after her husband's death. Her stories became a favorite of the women in court, and she was eventually invited to be the lady-in-waiting to the empress. This was a large promotion. 
the Empress actually enjoyed Mudasaki's stories. It was obvious that Mudasaki Shikibu took after her grandfather in her writing talents. Writing stories such as these were actually typical for women. They were sort of like a fan fiction for women by women. Um, they were known as monogatari and they weren't typically read by men. They were kind of like a girly thing. And Murasaki Shigibu was the queen of writing monogatari. So at this time, Murasaki Shigibu had not yet written the book that would make her famous today. And the story behind that goes that it said that the Empress grew bored of the books that she had been reading, so she asked Murasaki Shikibu to write a new story, one that would surprise and impress her. So Murasaki went to meditate on a story, and looking at a white full moon one night, she was then inspired to write the tale of Genji. It's believed that Murasaki Shikibu died before finishing the book, and that the book was actually finished by her daughter, but that's still speculation. They're not quite sure about that. So what is this tale of Genji even about? Well, the tale of Genji is kind of like a telenovela, but we're going to just talk about it really quickly. It's also called Genji Monogatari, and it basically follows the life of Genji. The book's about 54 chapters long and more than a thousand pages in length. The part of the book that's widely known and understood is the part where we follow Genji's life up until his death, not really the part where we follow Genji's son. Those are the later chapters that may have been added on by her daughter. So Genji is born as the son of the emperor Kiritsubo and a prostitute called an intimate. And this prostitute is the lowest on the rank. So in Japanese court, they had courtesans and prostitutes. Courtesans were also wives to the emperor, but they could become the empress. Intimates could never become anything other than a prostitute, so she was the lowest rank. And she dies. Because of that, Genji's father cannot accept him as the heir to the throne because he had a relationship with an intimate. So for political reasons, he removes Genji from the line of succession, and he demotes him to a commoner by giving him the surname Minamoto. And then Genji pursues a career as an officer. And Genji also marries a woman named Aoi, but at the time he's very young, so he's kind of too young to really truly love her. Instead, his eyes wander and he falls in love with a woman named Fujitsubo, who's a little bit older, who apparently resembles his dead mother. In secret, he has a son with Fujitsubo, who becomes the heir to the throne. But Fujitsubo is not Genji's true wife, and the child can never really be his child, because it's scandal. So he longs for something more. This is where it gets a little creepy. <laughs> but So Fujitsubo has a 10-year-old niece that resembles Fujitsubo. So Genji adopts her creepily, and when she comes of age, he marries her. And her name is Murasaki, and that is his Genji's true love. So in the story, Murasaki is Genji's true love and heroine of the story. And we believe that Murasaki Shikibu gets her first name from the heroine in her story. Anyway, of course, you have to kill off the heroine, so she dies. And Genji is forever heartbroken. But not heartbroken enough, apparently, because he continues to see many other women. Um... And this kind of gives us insight to the Heian court of the time. Men would have multiple wives. Um, the emperor would definitely have multiple wives. So Genji goes along with his uh, playboy-like attitude, but he gets himself into trouble because he sleeps with the daughter of a chief political officer. And this chief political officer finds this out, and then he forces Genji to flee. And so Genji flees, leaving behind everything. And afterwards, he kind of takes a vow of celibacy, and he retires to a temple, and he dies. So this is where that story ends. The story continues and follows his son, but we're not going to talk about that. The original story has these amazing images that go along with it. And the images that we're going to be focusing on today are a 12th century scroll, Genji Monogatari Imaki. And Imaki just means that it's an illustrated hand scroll. And they look somewhat like this. So keep in mind that the Japanese read right from left and up and down. So that's different from how we would look at it. So this scroll contained illustration scenes from Genji together with handwritten text. And the scroll is the earliest example of Japanese picture scroll with collected illustrations and calligraphy of a single work. 
The original scroll is believed to have comprised of 10 to 20 rolls and covered with 54 chapters and 19 illustrations. What we see here represent only a small portion of the original works that had been lost. So the style in which they're painted is the Yamato-e. It is a form of painting in which the underlining paper was covered entirely with heavy pigment. And there are four steps to this process. In the first step, a series of scenes were chosen from a respected monogatari, which is a fictional book typically written by women. So they would choose many scenes from one of these books, right? And in the second step, the piece was executed in black and white, so it kind of like an underdrawing or a preliminary sketch. Then, in the third step, the pigment was added and the basic drawing and details were colored in. The, the last step, the original black, which are now covered by paint, were drawn back in with ink in order to make the pictures stand out more. So typically what you do is you outline things in black if you want them to stand out more. The Japanese typically did this. The Japanese use a lot of flat color and flat line. So the images were probably created in 1120 to 1140. Um, there's still a little bit of speculation about that. Some of the images that I really like that I would just like to quickly talk about. There's this one here of a man courting a woman and he's playing an instrument. This is kind of painted from the above perspective, so we're looking at it from an aerial viewpoint. A lot of these images are actually like that. Another image that's really lovely is um, this cherry blossom image where you see a cherry blossom tree here in the middle of what looks like a porch where these women dressed in hay and court attire are kind of just enjoying the springtime. And you can see that they're wearing very colorful clothing and their hair is very long. Another intimate and beautiful image is a depiction of the screens that actually divide the women. So we have this screen that looks like it's decorated here in the middle. We have a woman reading something, and then we have another woman brushing another woman's very long hair. So this is a really intimate moment um, in the hidden scenes of the female life in the hanging court. We have a couple of these female hanging out scenes, and they typically show women reading or writing um, or taking part in drinking tea, but they're usually seen amongst screens, so that's kind of interesting. We have this kind of intimate piece here where we have the woman behind the screens, but then we also have a man and a female um, in their own section over here, and we can tell that um, one of the figures is male because of his hairstyle. This particular image has some really beautiful blue in it. I really like the colors that they chose for these scrolls. The pigments are faded because of just how old they are, but you can tell that the Heian court life was very colorful, that the clothes that they wore were very colorful. I also like how the figures are kind of depicted as waves or these blobs of fabric. I find this to be very interesting. And finally, this is a scene where Genji is mourning the loss of Murasaki, his one true love, and you can see Murasaki over here alone, and Genji's kind of mourning her a little bit outside of where she is allegedly dying.